Although this program was recorded before the Sandinistas lost the 1990 elections, it contains information which is not presented by the establishment media. We were very uh, nervous being in El Salvador because we were harassed immediately as we came in and detained for a couple of hours in the airport. Mm. And then the, one, the organizer of the tour came in and got us and talked our way in and told them what we were going to do. And um, all during the tour, we had to be very careful about who we spoke to. We had to be careful about what we said. We couldn't use words like peace. We couldn't mention certain countries. You we mean while you were traveling around? While we were in there, and we were followed, and people were listening to us. People were posted to listen to us in the hotel we were and, um, and in restaurants that we would go to. Now, how did that compare when you were traveling in Nicaragua then? Yeah, Nicaragua was a huge contrast. As soon as we got to Nicaragua, we could relax. It seemed like people were laughing again, you know, on the streets, and, and um, we could split up and go wherever we wanted in, as individuals without fearing for each other's lives. And, um, were you followed there like you were? Not in Nicaragua, no. We couldn't, we couldn't distinguish anybody who was there to listen to us or follow us at all. The human rights situation in El Salvador is, is horrendous. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of testimony from people who had had their family members um, disappeared, as they say, where they come and just take them at night from eating dinner or whatever. And uh, there are a lot of outright slaughters where people are lined, off, lined up and just uh, macheted or shot into a ditch. Um, it, it was just real shocking to even think about that sort of thing going on, but it's very, very common and everyone has lost a, a family member due to that sort of thing in El Salvador. Well, there's an awful lot of torture that goes on in the prison. Yes, the criminal justice system is horrible. They have, when somebody's arrested, they don't even have to tell them why they're arrested. They're Im immediately put 15 days in incommunicado and they undergo a, an interrogation at the end of which, which usually includes ter torture, at the end of the interrogation, they are usually asked to sign a blank piece of paper, and then whatever the government wants to accuse them of is typed on above their signature as a confession. We go on a trip to El Salvador and Nicaragua with Kathleen Stockwell, and she shows us the differences between those two countries right now on Alternative Views. government tells us that the government of El Salvador is a budding democracy. They're a little bit flawed, but they're making good progress, whereas Nicaragua is a communist totalitarian state. Well, you don't see much of on the media of people who actually have had experience in Nicaragua and El Salvador coming back and saying what they saw and what they've experienced. Right now in Alternative Views, we have Kathleen Stockwell, who's going to do just that for us. Kathleen has traveled in El Salvador and has had extensive experience in Nicaragua. So tonight we're going to show you some slides which she took in both countries, and she's going to compare the two countries and what she has seen and what she has experienced. Kathleen, uh, you, this is your second time in El Salvador, but the other was just kind of passing through very quickly. Yeah. But you've had extensive uh, uh, traveling experiences and working down in Nicaragua. Can you give us a brief history of your experience in those two countries? Yes, uh, Nicaragua, I was just heading south with my backpack, essentially, and stopped in Nicaragua and was really interested in what was going on and uh, acquired a job helping to translate some articles from English to Spanish and Spanish to English. And I ended up staying for about six months and 
And when was it? That was in 84. Yeah. And since then, I've been so fascinated and I've made so many friends that I've been back virtually every year since then. And um, one of my trips back was by land and I went through El Salvador and it was really a, a horrifying experience because there is a very real war in the countryside in El Salvador. And this time, this summer, was the first time I'd ever been with a group of people. And El Salvador. I took a tour to El Salvador and Nicaragua this summer. It was a, a comparative study tour. And we had a real impressive experience. In fact, most Americans don't know that you can fly into Nicaragua without a visa. You can just go to the Houston airport, oh, really? San Antonio airport, buy a ticket, and fly directly to Nicaragua, get off the plane, no trouble. You have to have uh, a passport, I think. Uh, well, yeah, you do have to have uh, a passport, no but you don't need a visa. Whereas to go to El Salvador, I think you do have to have a visa. There's much more restriction on travel. In fact, there's a lot of areas of El Salvador you simply can't go because the civil war there is so uh, intense. We had a, uh, they checked us over thoroughly before everybody in the tour had to turn in uh, even a little description of themselves to get the visa to go to El Salvador and we had to do it a month in advance to be sure we could get the permission. It was much more difficult than Nicaragua where I've always gone with no forewarning whatsoever. Let's take a look at some of the slides that you took of uh, El Salvador and Nicaragua and uh, we'll share your experience. Okay. Um, our group was basically just Texans mm -hmm. and um, from all walks of life just interested in the situation because uh, not feeling like they had enough information from our own media and uh, the two-week tour was right in the middle of summer when a lot of people have a, have a break time and I uh, I want to say first that El Salvador is a beautiful country. It's all volcanoes and um, lakes and forests and the people actually live and survive up in these dense forests and have their villages and their home life up there. And the government, that is why the guerrilla force has been so strong against the government is that it's so dense and so thick. It, it does remind people a lot of Vietnam and therefore is compared to Vietnam because you can't just wipe out the whole country, although they're still trying. Well, now, when you were there, you saw in the streets a lot of evidence of resistance of people communicating with graffiti there, which was an interesting thing, isn't it? Yes. Um, the main uh, method of public outcry is spray cans and graffiti. <laughs> or, no, actually, they probably don't have spray cans. They probably just use paintbrushes and um, for lack of the materials. And we did see one demonstration down there where people, during the demonstration, would just, there were people on the sides of the demonstration who would just run alongside and spray some, a message on every wall all the way <laughs> up and down. Well, and the government had its own propaganda, the posters and all. What would the people do with that? Would they tear them down or just write graffiti over it? Or, well, uh, as, as posters get aged, you know, you, you can't be witnessed um, doing anything to the government posters, but the government has posters all over the place as well that are professionally rendered and they are um, up glorifying the army and joining the army and, um, and, and um, present, presenting evidence and pictures against the guerrillas, the FMLN, and with pictures of children that have been mined, whereas there is a lot of mining going on by both sides. They, the government is, of course, blaming all the mining on the guerrillas. I think it was real appropriate that one of the first stops of the group was going to the U.S. Embassy because the U.S. Embassy has so much to do with the running of the government in El Salvador. Several times the man who was speaking to our group referred to El Salvador or something that would happen in El Salvador. He would say, well, we can't permit. We, you know, referring to the U.S. <laughs> government as having the ultimate control of what goes on. And there are, he said that there are 55 military trainers in El Salvador now. That's a big lie, of course. Yes, and um, his presentation was very cold and, um, and broke the country into sections and was very impersonal, didn't refer to the people at all or to the situation. But it was, it was a real interesting stop for us. Did people challenge his opinions or question U.S. policy at all? In your group. We were told when we went to the embassy that just for the sake of the, the group that gave us the tour not to be argumentative because they get um, criticisms later. They get a, a, a letter from the government, from the U.S. Embassy saying what they thought of that group.
mm. you know, that they brought. And so we could ask questions, but we weren't to be confrontational or argue. Were you harassed at all by the local police or government or military? Yes, we were very um, nervous being in El Salvador because we were harassed immediately as we came in and detained for a couple of hours in the airport. Mm. And then the, one, the organizer of the tour came in and got us and talked our way in and told them what we were going to do. And um, all during the tour, we had to be very careful about who we spoke to. We had to be careful about what we said. We couldn't use words like peace. We couldn't mention certain countries. You we mean while you were traveling around? While we were in there, and we were followed, and people were listening to us. People were posted to listen to us in the hotel we were and, um, and in restaurants that we would go to. So it was not a free feeling at all. We were real frightened and we were afraid of, you know, we're used to being free and easy here in the States. And so when you go and you have to be in a more controlled situation, put on a different mentality, you're constantly flipping and you're constantly, you know, hearing yourself say something you weren't supposed to say that was audible. Mm. Or, or you're always afraid of risking somebody else's life, not so much your own, by what you say to them or around them. Now, how did that compare when you were traveling in Nicaragua then? And Nicaragua was a huge contrast. As soon as we got to Nicaragua, we could relax. It seemed like people were laughing again, you know, on the streets. And, and um, we could split up and go wherever we wanted in, as individuals without fearing for each other's lives. And, um, were you followed there like you were? Not in Nicaragua, in Nicaragua. no. We couldn't, we couldn't distinguish anybody who was there to listen to us or follow us at all. And what Whereas about it was real the, clear in El Salvador. Yeah, what about the everyday life in El Salvador, the people? Could it would be a very hard life to live in El Salvador. The people have a visible stress and strain on them. You can see it in their eyes. There's very little joy or laughter there. And there's a, a, a large amount of poverty, and we'll be getting into that on some of the slides. The human rights situation in El Salvador is, is horrendous. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of testimony from people who had had their family members um, disappeared, as they say, where they come and just take them at night from eating dinner or whatever. And uh, there are a lot of outright slaughters where people are lined, off, lined up and just uh, macheted or shot into a ditch. Um, it, it was just real shocking to even think about that sort of thing going on, but it's very, very common and everyone has lost a, a family member due to that sort of thing in El Salvador. Well, there's an awful lot of torture that goes on in the prison. Yes, the criminal justice system is horrible. They have, when somebody's arrested, they don't even have to tell them why they're arrested. They're Im immediately put 15 days in incommunicado and they undergo a, an interrogation at the end of which, which usually includes torture, at the end of the interrogation, they are usually asked to sign a blank piece of paper, and then whatever the government wants to accuse them of is typed on above their signature as a uh, confession. Last fall, there were 1,200 political prisoners that were taken, and um, they and and when you compare that to uh, accusations of Nicaragua taking political prisoners. It's uh, insignificant compared to what they do in, in El Salvador with no repercussions and no way out. Not to mention the 80,000 people that the death squads have done away with mm -hmm. over the past few years in El Salvador. Yeah, it's so, actually more than that, I'm afraid. Is it so, more than that? So this is still going on, the political arrests in El Salvador and the death squads? It's claimed to be at a lesser degree right now, like it's a lull in the war, but it's, it's still going on and the system has not changed. And yeah, I read somewhere uh, an administration spokesperson was saying, well, there are only about 25 people a month or 35 people a month being killed by the death squad, so that's good progress. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what the ambassador told us, too. The only, the Human Rights Commission that's independent from the government, we spoke to a representative from it, and they said that um, the only justice that was ever done on any of these arrests or massacres or death squad um, annihilations of people. The only justice done on any of them was the one by, that was required by the U.S. pressure after the four nuns were killed. All of the thousands and thousands of people that have been killed, um, the innocent people that have been killed have had no repercussion to justice and no one has been brought out and put into jail because of the killings that have been done. And the death, death squads include police and government people as well as right-wing uh, vigilante groups. In fact, a lot of the death squads have been trained by the CIA yes. for years back. Yes. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, the head of the death squads was almost uh, put in to be elected president to Dobuisson, right. but 
he was so controversial that the U.S. had to um, negate him, and now he's the head of the right-wing party that we also went to visit. The, oh, you visited it? Yeah, we saw Dobison. You well, saw Dobison himself? Yeah. What happened? What, what did you talk about? Um, we uh, asked them questions about what you know their feeling was about what was going on in the country, and their solution was purely military. They agreed with all the other groups that we met with during our tour that the main thing that needed to be done was U.S. control to be removed from the government of El Salvador. And, but their only difference between that and other people's was that they wanted more military money and more military equipment, but less control over what they did with it. Well, well that Reagan wants to give them, uh, what, 150 or 200 million more just for their police and, their, and the army there. Of course, the reason Dobasson wants the Americans out because the Americans are supporting Duarte. Yeah. Also, they uh, yeah. put some restraints on his death squad activities, yeah. so it would be better for him not to have any constraints at all. Well, I understand in the past uh, couple of years or so, the biggest mass atrocity has been the big bombings by the El Salvadoran Air Force, sponsored and supported by the U.S., of the people who are out in the countryside. Yes, and um, a little bit later we will be going into uh, a trip we took out to uh, the Guazapa volcano, where the Phoenix operation has been going on as late as uh, 86 last year. They call it Phoenix there? The Phoenix operation. Isn't that ironic? Because ironic. it's the same name that, that the Americans used for their huge death squad operation in Vietnam, which uh, slaughtered up to 50 or 80,000 people. And it hasn't changed in nature either. Yeah. Um, El Salvador is suffering right now, especially the capital in San Salvador, from the earthquake damage, since they did have a fairly recent earthquake. And of course, um, very little aid has gone to rebuilding and rebuilding the housing, and a lot of people are homeless because of it. Um, one community that we did get to visit was called the April 22nd community, and this was a, an influx of people that had no place to go. They were coming in from the war several years ago, and they took over a large area of land on the edge of town, kind of between a highway and a train track, and it's it's like a huge ghetto and they've just put shacks together from parts it's just whatever scrap they can find on the streets of the city and the houses are, are very close together the only thing between them is a small area that you could walk through and which usually has a trickling stream of sewer going down it there's no facilities for education or there's sanitary facilities all they have in there is what they create themselves and they are um, doing some things for that. How many people are in this area? Oh, thousands. Um, uh, it'd be real difficult to estimate. I'd say 5,000 off of the top of my head, although it's always changing. There are, during the earthquake, I'm sure more people went there to, to build, you know, even tighter quarters mm -hmm. in that area. And people, some people are leaving now to try to go and repopulate where they were chased from during the war trying to, to get back and make well, their homes Are they doing again. anything to help their own condition uh, since the government isn't doing anything for them? Oh, they certainly are. They have um, a, a daycare program where women that aren't going into town are volunteering to, ha to take care of the children so other women can go in and, and uh, sell things on the streets or whatever they can to bring in a pittance to help their family out. They, um, are, they are trying to initiate classes. They are creating crafts so that they can sell to tourists and, and to stores and in the market so they can raise some money in order to get their sanitation taken care of and different things that are needed. What's the general employment situation in the uh, country? Is it mass unemployment? Seventy percent unemployment. Seventy? Seventy percent. So it's really grim. Everyday it, yeah. life there, and, and they don't have any public uh, public services to help these people. No. They don't have any. There's no social security. And there's no public services like we're used to. And how about health and housing, education? The health and the housing and the education are the lowest. Um, uh, they're totally catastrophic economically. The health budget is the same it was 15 years ago, and the population since then has has grown several times over. Mm. Now, how does this compare with Nicaragua as far as health and education is concerned? Uh, Nicaragua, of course, has uh, well-known reforms that were done in, in health and education, and um, a huge amount of the populace is literate now, and the child mortality and the life expectancy are much greater 
the child mortality is less and the life expectancy is greater than before because of the, the focus that the Sandinistas have put on improving those areas. And what about unemployment in Nicaragua? Do you have a feel for that? I'm not sure um, what the figures are on that, but it's the same as most third world countries. A lot of people do work in the markets and a lot of people are um, work in different odd jobs, but you, find, you don't find people that aren't working and everyone is fed because everyone is guaranteed certain, certain things, rice and beans for one. There are like six guaranteed items that people get even if there are no more, you know, in the war economy, often you have a lot of shortages in rationing. And but it, rather than call them rationing, the people say, oh, these are guaranteed to us. And, and so they, is, they don't, if they don't have anything, they've certainly got uh, enough to keep them alive. And, and this is that communist dictatorship that the, yeah. or the U.S. government talks about compared yeah. to El Salvador where they don't do anything for them. Yeah, the poverty in the economy in Nicaragua is atrocious, but the people, somebody told me, well, at least we're not Honduras. For example, in Honduras, with America, our government has put in millions of dollars of military aid. Nothing has gone down to the people, and Honduran people are starving. Now, you went to the palace, uh, the government, uh, governmental palace in El Salvador. How did you get in there, and what was the response to the people? Whom did you see? We had an interview with the Minister of Interior, and it was uh, real impressive to us to see their attitude. Um, it was a very opulent environment. The house had also undergone some damage from the earthquake, but that, that damage was being repaired. And the rooms were, it was like being in one of those ancient ca castles with uh, ornate sculpture and, and uh, but of course the modern, all the modern um, carpeting and furniture that you would expect. And this very expensively dressed man came and um, gave us his, feeling of what was going on in the country and he expressed his concern over the economic situation. But I also gauged a great deal of, um, of disdain on his part for the poor and for the general population. And he, uh, he actually said that, he, he quoted to us, you know, he was speaking in English, whereas a lot of our interviews were in Spanish. He said, well, you know the common idea in the states that Latin American people are very lazy. He said that's especially true here in El Salvador. These unions and people that are demanding more money and are demanding um, health health rights and uh, insurance from their union from their jobs are actually just lazy people. They just are not working enough. And in Latin America, having been to the other countries in Latin America. El Salvador is held up as being the country where the people are the most industrious and the most hardworking, you know, as far as um, as opinions go about how they how they actually are. So I was real, really disappointed to hear this coming from somebody who was in charge of the government. It's not surprising, though. There's been a lot of repression of unions and union leadership in El Salvador, hasn't there? Yes, there certainly has. We had some bitter experiences ourselves while we were down there. Um, some demonstrations began while we were there that we actually, without meaning to, became, came too close to the day we went to the palace. There was a demonstration in front of the palace. And they, um, the demonstration grew and it was uh, people demanding, they had a list of demands for their job. It was the, the Social Security Office, which is um, actually more of a militia than a Social Security. It doesn't mean that you get a guarantee. It, it's a different sort of system. but. They were protesting and they were, um, they had a walk out of their job and they were having um, the parades and the demands were all sorts of things including maternity leave and, and uh, a higher wage and, and it, was, it was not anything outrageous that was demanded. Uh, about three days after we left El Salvador while we were in Nicaragua we read a paper that, that gave us an account of a, a demonstration that came after the ones that we had seen after the ones that had been building up where the soldiers had opened fire and had killed several people and arrested some more. And so it was real shocking to us to have been so close to the beginning of that and to feel more in touch with the, the, the problems that the country was having. Well, there have been a lot of labor leaders who have been killed by the death squads too, haven't there? Yes, anyone who organizes or is a leader of any kind can 
pretty much expect to be harassed or disappeared. Including religious uh, leaders. One of the most famous, of course, is the Bishop uh, Romero, mm -hmm. who was assassinated while he was giving a mass in church. Yes, and we did go to the church, his church, where he was assassinated and um, visited his tomb in there. And it was a real moving experience knowing what we did at this point. Okay, let's talk about the Comadres. We hear a lot about them. Can you tell us about them and what that means? The Comadres is the organization of mothers of the disappeared. Mm. They uh, were so frustrated in losing their family members that a group of women got together and decided to organize and, and open up files and try to find the missing people. And they, do, they have to do difficult things like go to the dump, uh, body dumps and try to recognize people and take pictures and when people are found on the side of the street that have been assassinated, they, they go and try to find out who they are right away. Recently, um, last spring, their office was bombed and a lot of the files were burned that they had so carefully accumulated. Now they're in a borrowed office space, which is very cramped right down the street. Um, but it, it's just real shocking to us that a group of mothers who is trying to find people who is not doing a political activist, specifically a political activist program, is bombed by right-wing squads. For this once again with Nicaragua, are there any death squads that are operating in Nicaragua outside of the Contras? No, there, there were no many death squads right. under Somoza and people still remember not being able to take dates out at, at night in Nicaragua because of the fear of being pulled over or being pulled out of your house at night and being killed for no reason but now there are none. In fact, I visited the region in uh, Nicaragua where they used to dump the uh, dead bodies that were killed by Somoza's uh, death squads, and evidently there's similar regions in uh, El Salvador outside of the city where periodically you find stacks of bodies that the death squads had killed on a given uh, day or week. Yeah, recently in California they've had some hearings um, due to the new INS, the INS immigration laws where people from El Salvador have had to go in and, and do lengthy testimony in front of judges to show that they really do deserve political asylum because of the situation. And, and I was just reading one where um, a man was lined up and shot in, on top of one of those body dumps and, mm -hmm. and um, jumped off before he was hit. I think it was by a machete, actually, and, and woke up among the bodies but stayed quiet until the police left and then escaped the country. Wow. And now our government is trying to send him back. And so, um, well, did you stay in uh, El Salvador? The, I mean, in San Salvador the whole time, or did you travel out into the countryside much? No, we stayed in in San Salvador for most of our meetings with the groups and the unions to get a feel for what was going on. You know, we were, we were visiting all all from the right to the left, and um, well, actually, you can't really visit any organized left because they're not allowed. But the human rights and the education and the health, mm -hmm. and we went out and got military permission at a base to go to the Guazapa volcano where the Phoenix operations have been going on for so many years. Isn't that an area where uh, it used to be a um, guerrilla stronghold or is it still a guerrilla stronghold? The Guazapa volcano is 20 miles from the capital San Salvador and the guerrillas were holding it for a long period of time. In 84 when I was in San Salvador I could hear the bombing on, on the Guazapa volcano just 20 miles an hour away. Wow. And, and now the bombing is, is not happening any longer to the point where a group of people went back to repopulate the, co the cooperative that they had been living on for so many years before that, before they had to evacuate. We went to getting up to the Guazapa volcano, every house in every village that we went through on the road was destroyed by a bomb. And I was shocked, you know, I've never been through a bombed out area before, really. And I was shocked that they could hit every single building. You know, I didn't realize that there was that, that good aim you know, or that it had been that extensive that it could wipe out everything. And when we got to the cooperative, um, they, we found out that they had been a, a community, a large um, town of about 10,000 people. And 7,000 of those people had either been killed or displaced as refugees in another country by the by the war everyone had left the whole 10,000 had left and and but they couldn't account for about 7,000 of them and about 500 had moved back and were trying to rebuild 
some homes and, and get their community going again so that they wouldn't have to be living as, uh, in the slums around the cities. Well, did they organize their own community or did the government come in and c control it? They had a lot of difficulty even getting to their place. They were stopped by the military and, and um, Americans that were with them or actually Europeans that would be with them that were trying to help them get up through as you know, being protection by being foreigners were sent away so that they were left alone with the military and they just kept discussing and finally the resettlement was permitted by the government and the military and, um, and then they just started doing it on their own from sanitation to education to farm working to everything. The government often would send somebody in and say well we would like to have somebody in here to help you do the sanitation and they would say well we have it taken care of you can see we have all everybody's got their own own system going and um, and then they would send somebody and say, well, we would like this person to be your teacher. And they were always trying to send somebody from the government in order to always be there in the village to report on the village. And they never would, they, would, they always had everything taken care of until finally now they just send military through and the military periodically patrol and just go through by surprise looking in all the doors. And, and the guerrillas going. don't operate in that area anymore then, huh? Not, not in the way they were before the, the Phoenix operation. Did you get a sense of what the military situation was in terms of the war? Had the guerrillas been active at the time that you were there? Was the war fairly intense or was it more quiescent? There, well, it seemed to be getting close to some dialogue when we were going there and actually there has been some since we were there. Mm -hmm. The figures that I know of are that the government has 51 thousand troops I understand and the guerrillas have more like 46 but then you can also count for the guerrillas um, the masses that support them and the militia that are in the villages and if you were going to count those um, so actually it's pretty balanced or actually heavier on the guerrilla side which is why the US military is, is so much what the government is based on so the dialogues so they so the guerrillas do have enough strength to be able to create the need for di for the government to have dialogue. So I'm really happy to see some sort of dialogue going on now. The government back in, what was it, 1982, where they attacked and destroyed the University of San Salvador? Did you visit that area? Yes, we did go to the university, and it has reopened only due to the initiative of the students who have raised the money and, and rebuilt, you know, put up tents and and uh, gotten some books and, and our having the classes going again. Everyone at the university was very young, you know, even the professors, most everyone else had, had been killed before or was more easily intimidated than the youth who were trying to learn. The university had been uh, a center of, of resistance for the government, which is why it was attacked and, and leveled. And as we know, universities here in the States were the center for resistance during the Vietnam War, for example. So they are rebuilding and, and uh, appealing to the United States students to send them books to rebuild their library. And um, yes, the library was just almost completely destroyed. All, all the books were destroyed, yes. Well, we've noticed in the pictures that there's graffiti inside the walls, uh, pro-guerrilla graffiti. Now, was that put in after the students reoccupied it? or Probably before and after. they. Um, a lot of the buildings that they might try to reoccupy, they're not even safe walking in. Uh, the, 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 even though they were bombed out by the military, the earthquake as well did more damage. So a lot of, they, they use some buildings, but mostly they use tents and any buildings or any walls that are available are definitely spray painted and there's still a lot of activism in the university and there's also a lot of, of repression going on again. Let's talk about Nicaragua now. You've spent so much time down there over the past several years. What is it like now after all these years of, of struggle and trying to keep the country together in spite of the fact of the war going on? Well, Nicaragua is a, a wonderful place to be. It's, there's a lot of going there for us as a group. It was like breathing a sigh of relief. You know, now we can relax. You know, now we can wander around and do what we want and the people there though are definitely stressed out because the economy is the 700 percent percent inflation whereas uh, to show you a concrete example of what's happened to their money system the Cordoba used to go 160 
for one dollar would be the exchange, and now it, it's up to four thousand four thousand cordobas to the dollar on the black market. So for us to buy uh, to pay a meal at the restaurant, it was like opening up a suitcase that you'd stolen from the bank. You had to count out all of these bills in order to to pay, and, and it was really outrageous. And the people are feeling it too. The people are, are really stressed out economically. They've got their guarantees, their rations, if you will, but um, not much else. And it's very hard to afford anything else. And um, well, and they do have this safety net, as you were talking about, the guarantee of food. They have health benefits, and they have education, free health and free education. Yeah. Uh, but then. It was this trip where somebody out. told me, at least we're not Honduras. I mean, at this point, where they're the worst they've ever been economically, they're still better off than their neighbors who are being given U.S. money. When I went down there this summer, they told us that 52% of their budget went towards the military to fight the uh, Contra War, and approximately 50% of their labor power was devoted to war-related activity, which was just crippling them economically. The first couple years of the Sandinista regime, they made the most impressive economic process progress in Latin America. They had the highest rate of growth. They had this successful literacy and health campaigns. But this has really been hampered by the Contra War. So to some extent, Reagan has succeeded in his aim of making life difficult, at least, for the Nicaraguans, if not overthrowing the uh, Sandinista government. So it's just several years of war that have taken their toll. Yeah, that's the whole purpose of the Contras. The whole purpose of the Contras is to stress out the economy and stress out the country. And that's why they use terrorism. They, it used to be more able, they used to be able to use terrorism in a more secret way, where it wouldn't get all of this uh, negative publicity here in the States. But the purpose of the Contras is to, to make the country so miserable that, that it succumbs and that it kicks out its own government. And so necessarily, when you're under that kind of pressure, you lean further and further to the left. So rather than creating a democracy, which we easily could by offering um, humanitarian aid instead, we're creating, we're creating a more leftist state. Whereas they started out as, uh, as a social democracy and a very uh, comparable to Costa Rica, you know, they have to get more and more aid from the left, from the east side, by, for survival. And that makes them angrier and angrier at our capitalist system. And, make, and, and so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then at this point, Reagan can point his finger and say, see, you know, they're becoming more Marxist now, whereas it's, it's our own, it's our own subterfuge that's creating it. The but, was, then, yeah. but on the other hand, uh, it used to be that there was 60% of the economy in private hands, 40 in government hands. Has this changed? No, they're still, they're still maintaining um, all of the, a, th a very social democratic economy, and they're making all the compromises and and all of the offerings that they can. As the, and, and to me, I don't know if I would be able to do that if I was a Nicaraguan. I'm constantly angered by things like the amnesty program. Recently at Garachamoro, the, the leader, one of the leaders of the Contras has accepted the Nicaraguan amnesty program under the peace plan. And whereas Nicaragua has had an open amnesty welcoming back any Contras to reintegrate for four or five years now, and, and, but that's never been recognized or acknowledged by now. You never hear about the democratic election they had the same time that Reagan was elected. They elected Ortega in the most fair elections ever documented in, in Latin American history. And, and I'm just, I would have a real hard time continuing to be nice if I was a Nicaraguan after the historical oppression that our country has put upon Kathleen, it. Kathleen, could you uh, document that last uh, claim? Over and over we heard from Oliver North and the Reagan administration that Nicaragua was a totalitarian communist dictatorship. I think North said that uh, Nicaragua is the only country in Central America that doesn't have a democracy. And even liberals have picked up this refrain, how there's no democracy in Nicaragua. It's a one-party totalitarian state. I saw an op-ed piece in the New York Times just this week that cited in one breath Chile, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Paraguay as examples of Latin American countries that had one-party states and no democracy. What is your answer uh, to that very frequent uh, charge? Well, that's the line that the government has been doing, and, and I find it totally false. There were seven parties that participated in the election, and they all had equal airtime, equal press time, equal monies to work with. 
and the Sandinistas legitimately won that election. And, and I think what's interesting, they didn't win with as large a uh, majority as they They won 60 percent. Yeah, yeah, they were anticipating about 80 percent. And, and they, they won 60 percent because it was open. People were not intimidated to vote for the Sandinistas. People could vote for whoever they wanted. They did have a huge turnout. It was like a 90 percent turnout to vote. And, you know, when we think of our pitiful turnouts for voting mm -hmm. in comparison, you think of what is a real democracy. You know, I'm rather envious of that. The El Salvadoran, if you want to make a comparison, in El Salvador, the elections that they have are very, uh, the people are, have a certain number and card so that they, everybody, the government knows how they voted and people are intimidated to vote a certain way. And there are many uh, documentations of, of, military, of military oppression in places where the vote w would be going on, on more left to a more leftist party and there really are no leftist parties that are allowed to function in El Salvador so Nicaragua is much more democratic than El Salvador which is the country our government is well, supporting. In the election there were about a couple parties to the left of the Sandinistas and a couple or so to the right yeah. of the Sandinistas. Yeah, San the Sandinistas were the moderate party in the elections. Now are there still some uh, conservative or right-wing um, opposition parties that are functioning and also participating in the uh, their Congress. Yes, the, all of the parties that were in the elections participate in the in the Congress. The ultra right wing party, which was the one that we were that we heard so much about because they boycotted the elections, that was of their own choice. They probably boy, boycotting them was a smart thing because they didn't have enough support to even make a dent. But um, so they are not allowed to work in the Congress either since they were boycotting. And but the seven parties that were, which are right and left parties all put the Constitution, the new Constitution that was drafted together, working together. And Which they ratified. Did you see other uh, evidence of forms of democracy in Nicaragua? In many c countries in the world, like Nicaragua, democracy means something a bit different than just voting in elections. There's neighborhood committees, there's workers' democracy in the factories, there's peasant cooperatives and democratic organization of agriculture in the countryside. Did you experience any of this when you were on your trip this summer to Nicaragua or previously? I enjoyed it a lot the, what I saw and learned of the flexibility of the Sandinista government. It's obvious from the beginning, if you really study what they've been doing, that they've been trying to help and they've been trying to help the poor first. And, but where they make a judgment that is wrong, or that doesn't work very well, where they receive feedback from the people, and they change, they make a change towards that. For example, every week the president still goes and meets the people in a meeting called Cara al Pueblo to face the people, and people will come up, the poorest campesino can go up and start dialoguing with the president and present, saying, well, we didn't get a shipment of seeds to, to in time this year, and, and, uh, or, or whatever needs changing. And the government readily admits mistakes and, and makes a change to, to uh, make the situation better. Well, they made a significant change in their farm policy, didn't they, from cooperatives to individual uh, smaller land holdings of yeah. private farmers? Yeah, the first brainstorm of the government was that people would be more happy on cooperatives working together. They would have more strength. They would be able to have more machinery because it would be donated to the whole cooperative. And they would be able to... Um, have huge crops that they could market more easily and make themselves wealthier as a cooperative. Um, but a lot of people, while a lot of people still do love to be on a cooperative as a community like that, many people they found out want to have their own land. So a new reform is in, pra in place to let people have more individual plots and so that so that everybody is, is, is happy with what they're getting. And yet they've set up organizations so that the large landowners are organized and they're highly influential in the government and protecting their land yes. from uh, any type of redistribution. Yes, there's a lot of private, uh, virtually everything that you ask about is privately owned in Nicaragua as you walk around. Well, now we've read there, there has been a clampdown to some degree on civil liberties because of the uh, problems created by the war. To what was the extent? Now we know that the one of the op opposition newspapers was shut down and some radio stations and a church radio station uh, was shut down. Well, what else happened in, in this regard? Um, 
as far as being able to to uh, rally, I believe in in groups, you have to get a permit to do that. The I've had a hard time finding specifics on on what kind of liberties were were clamped down upon because as you go to Nicaragua, I mean, even as we went this summer, we were free to go anywhere we wanted. And we were free to speak any way we wanted. Did people freely speak to you and criticize the government? Nobody if they had to? any problem giving us their beef and. Right. Usually the beef is directed to my government rather than the Sandinista <laughs> government. Although I was staying in a hotel there that was obviously run by a conservative um, family, and they were criticizing the government openly, as were all the people who were sitting around, although they were having discussions where there were different points of views, just like you get in the U.S. So the people didn't seem to be hesitant to speak out against uh, the government when they felt the desire to there. Yeah, you, you don't find that kind of dialogue in El Salvador. <laughs> <laughs> Not for long. No. <laughs> but uh, now they have, uh, as a result of the ARIAS plan, they have uh, rescinded a lot of these things, or, or all of them. How much, uh, how many of these things are actually done away with, and how much uh, more freedoms are they allowing now? Uh, as far as I understand, it's as it was before the, um, they were implemented um, up to, it was about two years ago, I think they were implemented because the war was getting so fierce and they were implemented to no greater extent than we implemented similar restrictions during our wars, World War One and Two, and any other country does, but um, they have been released now under the plan. And sure. they things seem to be no as normal and the, the, uh, criti the critical radio stations are back on and uh, the La Prensa has been opened up and um, well, they've been amazing to me, amazingly gentle on the opposition because, uh, for instance, Amando Bravo, the bishop there, was actually supporting the Contras and even getting uh, money from the CIA, according to the results, uh, the reports that we, we saw. And uh, so I, I can't imagine. And they also let uh, the La Prensa publish pro uh, contra things and knowing also that the prince la prince was getting uh, american money to operate on can you imagine during world war ii if we'd have let the uh, pro-nazi uh, uh, papers uh, operate and with uh, german money <laughs> oh, no way they have done that yeah i doubt that la prensa was a big joke for people in in my neighborhood when i was living in nicaragua they would come up and show me the newspaper and say because you know, there's such a big deal made here about uh, censorship and they would show me a newspaper that was covered from front to back of criticizing the government and say, see how the censorship here in this country, you can't say anything against the government, you know, sarcastically speaking, of course. And the, the paper, I found some really strange articles in it, like once I read a review of torture in the world, uh, in government-instituted torture, and it, all of the countries supposedly that did torture in the world were all East Bloc countries, according to this newspaper. Communist countries, but never a capitalist yeah. country like no. uh, El Salvador, or Chile, or Paraguay. No, and uh, and our government that that is it's documented that our government trains torture in Latin America. So it's blatant propaganda, mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. uh, La Prensa. And liberals are always squawking about this, <laughs> the censoring of El Pren La Prensa, as if this is evidence that it's a totalitarian state in Nicaragua, and they never point out who owns and runs and finances La Prensa, what it actually printed, what its policies were, which was just blatantly uh, pro-contra at a time they were having a civil war. Yeah, La Prensa follows the, the blueprint, the CIA blueprint of how to take over a newspaper. It, um, it shut down right after the revolution, and 80% of the people working for it were fired or left, and then it reopened under a totally different format. And a lot of the stories I'm sure that have been censored have been written in Washington, D.C. Well, let's talk about, the, compare the penal system and prison system in Nicaragua with that of El Salvador. We've talked about the El Salvador repression, terrible system in the prisons and torture and rape of women. What about in Nicaragua? We did go to a, a prison in Nicaragua, and it was a very impressive prison. Um, I wouldn't expect our prisons here in the States to be so civilized. They had classes going on, they had workshops uh, teaching um, the prisoners ha to have a profession because most, most people become criminals because they don't have a focus in life and they don't have a profession to follow in. And they had a carpentry shop, for example, where the prisoners would make, of their own choice, they could go to that carpentry shop or they could go to some mm -hmm. other kind of workshop. And they would be making school desks and school chairs and 
the profits from selling those to back to the government would be um, to get benefits for themselves in the prison and you know better foods and and different su surprises and then and also to have a little, little something stashed away for when they got out of prison. They also teach them how to read and write. And mm -hmm. they had, as we walked through the the community area, the communal area in the prison, there were school classes going on on all sides of us. And what were was it political prisoners, or what were some of the reasons for the people being in the prisons? There were some political prisoners and criminals all together, and uh, there was there was not a separate place for anyone. Mm -hmm. um, the I understand that the contras contra, contra pr prisoners of war mm -hmm. are also put into these prisons as well. And they have uh, different degrees of prisons in Nicaragua. They have the maximum security, and then it goes down to several different layers. I presume this was a medium security prison that where we were, whereas they have some others that are totally free with no gates or guards that are more of a, a community, a village, which is kind of the last step before letting people go back into the society to try to function as a normal citizen. Kathleen, you were there during the Contra War, which has been, of course, going on for years. Did you have any exposure to some of the actual events of the war, see any evidence of the suffering that the Nicaraguan people have experienced as a result of the war? This two-week trip, my only exposure was that rally that we, we went to, a rally in Masaya, which was called Maria Mujer. It was a festival for the, for, to celebrate the mother, the Mary the Virgin. And um, delegations came from all over the country to this rally, but several, two groups that were on their way to the rally were ambushed by the Contras, and 11 people were killed, women and children. These were not soldiers at all, as, which is usual of a Contra attack. And so instead of a festival, it was a commemoration, and it was very sorrowful, and all the joyful costumes and decorations Nobody, people were not smiling, whereas, whereas they would have otherwise. And, you got and it was the, the first case of a priest having been killed by the Contras. And so this was a, a big blow to such a heavy Catholic country. And, and it was a real step up in them for, for the atrocities of the Contras. Well, you went to a resettlement village. Why would they have resettlement villages in Nicaragua? I can understand in... Uh, El Salvador, where the people would be coming into the city either seeking employment or, or fear of the, of the bombing. But is there that much a disruption in the countryside by the countries that people are coming into the city? There certainly are. As a matter of fact, it's become a big tool by the U.S. saying, well, you're taking people from their homes. The Sandinista government is removing, you know, for example, the mosquito resettlement programs. And, and uh, when actually the war in the in the mountain areas where people do have their villages and is disrupt is disrupted these people's lives and the resettlement has been going to villages that have been built by european aid and the sandinistas the people that go to the villages helping each other with the materials um, building these beautiful homes and we went to visit one um, impromptu we were rained out of where we were supposed to go so we went to another one and so we didn't feel like anything had been set up for us at all and these little villages were, the, the houses were very nice, little, you know, little Swiss type built houses and, and um, the community was very tight and the people in the community did their, protected themselves. They had their own militia to defend themselves against Contra's attacks because they were still in the war zone. Oh, well, this was up in the uh, northern area. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Although this wasn't right on the border where they had lived mm -hmm. before. Uh, about everybody in the town had experienced some sort of atrocity or lost a family member to the Contra battle and so had felt the need to escape from that area. And so uh, I did meet a, a wonderful old woman that I started speaking to while our group was meeting with the rest of the people. And she um, said that she would not go back to where she lived before even if the war stopped because she enjoyed this new community and the facilities they had so much better. Everyone had their own outhouse, and they had a farming area, and their own animals. And and um, then she took me back to her house to show me her house, which um, was a, a. I mean, they're very simple as can be expected, but it was a lot more than she had had before, and then that most people have in Latin American countries. Well, Kathleen, how many of them Ruskies did you see down there, <laughs> and them nasty Cubans? I didn't meet any Russians. I. I ran into a couple of Cubans. Most people that I ran into there were Europeans. 
I ran into people from Korea, from Germany, from England, from France. Most of the people I ran into there were from Italy. Of the 52 organizations that are European organizations that help Nicaragua, 12 of those are Italian. And most of them are sponsored by private aid, private aid from those countries. And they are agricultural and, and educational and health are the three main areas that the Europeans help Nicaragua. And it's uh, basically solidarity assistance because everybody realizes the situation that Nicaragua is in and our government seems to be quite isolated in its opinion of Nicaragua worldwide. Uh, people on, the, on both sides, the East and West Bloc, are helping Nicaragua very openly. I have the ARIAS uh, peace plan to look forward to. Do you have a sense that that might actually work in Nicaragua, that there is a possibility for um, peaceful settlement in that region? Yes, I think that the Central American governments getting together as they have on this plan and even the right-wing governments and the left-wing governments coming to an agreement on what their countries need. Central America has to solve Central America's problems. That's what it comes down to. And our government has to stop interfering and trying to control Central America because they are not our puppets. They, are, um, they have autonomy. They're beautiful countries. The people are wonderful and have a lot more patience than I think many of us would under the same circumstances of oppression. And there is a, a statement made to me by someone on this trip, I can't remember who it was, but they said El Salvador and Nicaragua are really the same after I'd been going over how much, the, how, how much they contrasted. They said in both countries the people want freedom. <laughs> We have time for a couple of news stories about El Salvador and the U.S. government. You wouldn't know it from the amount of news coverage, but the fighting in El Salvador has been a much bigger deal than what's been going on in Nicaragua. There's been claimed more lives for one thing, and the U.S. has pumped in $1.5 billion in war-related aid since 1981. And uh, what's also come out, according to this article, is that the uh, group of U.S. military advisors to the country that we've put in are now involved in the fighting themselves. Uh, we're starting to get body bags back from El Salvador. And the fighting, since we've become involved so heavily, uh, 60,000 people have died and 25% of the population has been displaced. Well, Reagan has decided that the police forces and the military in El Salvador just aren't getting enough money. And so they wants to pump 9.1 million more dollars in weapons and equipment to the police forces. And this is heavy duty stuff, shotguns, pistols, M16 rifles, uh, fitted with sniper scopes, ammunition, helicopters. And if this is approved, this 9.1 million is approved by Congress, El Salvador's funding in 1987 will come to more than $700 million, making it the third largest recipient of U.S. aid in the world. Thank you for joining us on Alternative Views. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Bye-bye.